Nick Martin reporting from the Isle of Man. Well, it's not just the depositors there who may have lost their savings. In total, more than 12,000 people lost nearly a billion pounds in the offshore arms of Icelandic banks, which aren't covered by the UK's financial services compensation scheme. Around 2,000 people had £117 million pounds saved with Landsbanki Jirgansi, where there's no depositor protection scheme. They've been offered an interim payment of 30 pence for every pound they had saved. On neighbouring Jersey, the Council of Ministers is proposing a scheme to guarantee the safety of bank deposits, but only for Jersey residents. British depositors have an estimated £50 billion pounds in banks on the island and up to £9 billion pounds in Jersey. But do these depositors deserve a bailout from London and does the financial crisis signal the end of the offshore saving industry in these crown dependents? Well, joining us now in the studio, Ziggy Chechko from the Kaupthing Isle of Man Depositors Action Group and from Glasgow, John McFall, Chairman of the Treasury Select Committee. Um, Ziggy Chechko first. Um, you recognise that the Isle of Man is a different entity from uh, the normal British system. Absolutely. And therefore, you have to look to them for your address. Initially, yes. But we also have to take a look at the culpability of the British government in, in our situation right now. Our understanding of the situation is that um, Kalpthing UK um, held £550 million pounds worth of Isle of Man assets within it when the UK authorities instructed the FSA to seize these assets and have currently still have them held in the UK. These are assets we belong believe to the Isle of Man depositors and we're requesting that the UK government um, instructs the administrators to release those assets so that our bank can carry on functioning normally. The difficulty with this situation is of course that as you know that the bank has many many creditors all over the world, uh, a good number of them in Britain. Um, and, of course, the reason the British seized those assets was that the vast majority of depositors were in Britain. That, that is actually true, but the thing to remember here, I think, is that Kalpthing UK was, from what we've heard, a solvent, liquid, very, very strong balance sheet holding bank at the, before the UK government took the actions against the Icelandic authorities and the Icelandic government. Mm. So, therefore, they brought down a bank that was actually quite strong, did not need bailing out. What would you say to people looking in who will say, look, come on, you took a double gamble. One, you invested in a bank which had interest rates which were way above anybody else's and people had said was not quite what it should have been at quite an early stage. We reported in March on it. And two, that you also banked on an island uh, which itself didn't really have the resource to save you if the worst happened. Well, there's two things to say to that. Firstly, we've got to take a look at who's actually been not investing but depositing in the Isle of, in the Isle of Man. These are people who've had their savings and just like anybody else go down to the bottom of the road into their local bank and put the money in. Quite a lot of these are expatriate Brits who um, work abroad for charities, overseas organisations, British companies overseas and they cannot get a UK bank account because they don't have a, a home on the mainland. So. Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man is the closest they, can, they have to keeping their money close to home. But then there's an awful lot of people who put their money there for tax reasons. They just don't want to have to pay British taxes. Uh, that's not necessarily true. I, I happen to live in London. I happen to be a full UK taxpayer and I happen to declare all my interests from the Isle of Man. So it's not actually a tax haven. It's just somewhere where if you go to the internet, take a look at comparison sites, good rate of interest. It makes financial sense. Well, John McFall in, 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 in Glasgow, um, as, as chair of the select committee, do you think these depositors in the Isle of Man have a case that the, the British government did seize money that was in that bank and they're saying give it back? Well, first of all, John, can I say that the Treasury Committee visited the Isle of Man, spoke to their government. They have a separate legislature and parliament and laws of their own, and they also have a separate regulator themselves. So the FSA writ does not run to the Isle of Man. And I think people who invest in the Isle of Man have to realise that. Secondly, though, there are a number of innocent people caught up in the situation. And as your contributor there said, there are people, British citizens, working abroad who, to have their accounts in Sterling, have to have them in, say, Isle of Man because they have no permanent residence in the United Kingdom. But this is an issue which we will be exploring in the Treasury Select Committee because we have announced a banking crisis inquiry and a week on Monday the Chancellor 
Alistair Darnley and the Governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, and the Chairman of the Financial Services Authority, Adair Turner, Lord Turner, will be coming to the committee and will be asking them these questions. For example, the dispute well, let me, let me about just, Iceland. Yeah, but, but, but something which really crops up immediately is the £550 million pounds that was deposited in the Isle of Man, which the British government seized. Um, now, that disabled the regulator there from doing anything because the bank was now no longer sustainable. If the British government hadn't taken that money, the regulator could have said, right, hold up, I mean, we'll now repay the depositors here. If we can't do it, he's got nothing to do it with. Well, uh, this is an area of dispute because on the 8th of October, Alistair Darling said that the Icelandic government were not going to honour their obligations, so the British government took that action. And that will be one very question, John, which we'll be asking on Monday the 3rd of November of the Chancellor. Right. Now, uh, can I just broaden this out? Because, of course, a lot of people looking at it said, it, this is crazy. I mean, what is the Isle of Man? What are Guernsey and Jersey? They seem to have the most mysterious status. I mean, these people are caught up, yes, and many of them very innocent uh, British people with every good reason to have accounts where they are. But you know as well as I do, one of the reasons why these havens exist is for tax evasion, tax avoidance, and indeed for money laundering. And uh, However well-intentioned every may be, why does this happen? Why isn't all this closed down and centralised in Britain? Well, this is, this is an issue which the committee have been asking. That's why we visited both the Isle of Man and Jersey and hope to visit Guernsey at a later date. John. But uh, there has been concern at European and actual international level about the issue of tax havens and tax policies. And indeed, Geoffrey Owen, the head of tax policy at the OECD, the Organisation for Economic Development in Paris, has said that tax havens should come under much more close scrutiny. And that's one thing that the Treasury Committee is doing at the moment, and looking at that in our inquiry into financial stability and transparency. Uh, John McFall, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Chechko, for coming as well.